Sister Anita Holzmer is admirably prepared to speak about the stigmata of St. Francis. In addition to bachelor's and master's degrees in education from the University of St. Francis, she has completed both a two-year program in Franciscan spirituality at the Antonianum, the International Franciscan University in Rome, and a master's degree in Franciscan studies from St. Bonaventure University in New York State. She has presented on Franciscan topics for several groups. Our own religious community, the Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration, the Conventual Franciscan Friar Novices, the Franciscan Brothers Minor and Sisters Minor in Fort Wayne, Secular Franciscan Fraternities in Indiana and Ohio, the International Congress on Medieval Studies in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Her image of the crucified was printed in the book Prayers from Franciscan Hearts, published by Franciscan Media. Sister Anita is eminently qualified to address us about the stigmata of St. Francis of Assisi, fact, fiction, or fallacy. Sister Anita. Thank you. The date is October 8th, 1226. You are a friar minor serving as the porter in a friary near Florence. Suddenly, a breathless confrere arrives at your convento with the parchment from the minister general, Brother Elias, stating that it must be read to all the friars immediately. You quickly tell the guardian, and within a few minutes, he has gathered the brothers in the refectorium. You listen with astonished sadness as the letter is read, announcing the death of the father and founder of your order, Brother Francis of Assisi. As the, prog as the reading progresses, you hear something absolutely incredible. And now, after telling you these things, I announce to you a great joy and the news of a miracle, such a sign that has never been heard of from the dawn of time except in the Son of God, who is Christ the Lord. Not long before his death, our brother and father appeared crucified, bearing in his body the five wounds which are truly the marks of Christ. His hands and feet had, as it were, the openings of the nails and were pierced front and back, revealing the scars and showing the nails' blackness. His side, moreover, seemed opened by a lance and often emitted blood. Imagine the shock, but at the same time the sense of newness and the implications both for the friars minor and for the Assisi townspeople. For the friars, Brother Francis would be like another Christ. At the same time, such a sign would have to come from God would not only be the divine stamp of approval for Francis's rule, but would also bring some prestige and credibility for the mendicant way of life that he founded. For the Assisi townspeople, this marvel would mean that their hometown boy has made it big, that Assisi would have a new patron saint, and his body would have to be protected from relic seekers and thieves and that there would be pilgrimages to his tomb in a new shrine church. And of course, that would benefit Assisi's economy. But wait a minute, did Brother Elias really see the marks? Are there other witnesses who saw the stigmata on Francis's body? Was there anyone who knew before his death that Francis bore the stigmata? How, when, where, and why did he get these wounds? Today we are 800 years removed from these events, and many people still ask these kinds of questions. Because we are so far removed in time from these happenings, we must rely on the written testimony of those who supposedly were witnesses, either to the presence of the stigmata on Francis's body, or perhaps to the stigmatization itself. 
Such testimonies are contained in what historians refer to as the Franciscan sources, 13th and early 14th century writings. The writings, a few of them by Francis himself, but most of them were written about him and about the early Franciscan movement. What do the sources say about these questions regarding the stigmata? Can an investigation of these sources answer our questions? Indeed, we will investigate some of the Franciscan sources during this lecture. But before we do that, I would add, where is the focus in even asking such questions? And does pursuit of the veracity of the stigmata mean that we are losing sight of something profound in the person of Francis himself? In this presentation, I will probe three of the 13th century Franciscan sources which report on Francis's stigmata and discuss some implications of those reports. I will present some answers for our questions as well as a thought-provoking conclusion of my own. There are actually a number of 13th century witnesses, both in the Franciscan and from other tra uh, Franciscan tradition and from other sources. First, you must know that Francis does not witness to the stigmata himself. That is, his writings are silent about it. Likewise, his earliest biographers indicate that, although a few individuals were able to see them, he went to great lengths to hide the wounds and that he never spoke about them. One account says, one time a companion saw the marks on his feet and said to him, what is this, good brother? But he replied, mind your own business. <laughs> Thus, what is left to us in the Franciscan sources is chiefly hagiographical literature. As a literary genre, hagiography, accounts of the lives of holy men and women, has been used since early Christian times to, re to inform, inspire, and encourage imitation. Its primary purpose is always to show the holiness of the subject, his or her likeness to Christ. Secondarily, hagiography was often used to comment on current events during the time of the author. In other words, a hagiographer may have had an ax to grind or a point to make, and this attitude could be subtly evident in the way that characters in the stories were portrayed. There are many hagiographical sources in the Franciscan tradition, all of which were composed by Friars Minor. But I will mention here the principal ones which give an account of, or at least mention, the stigmata. Francis's first biographer, Brother Thomas of Cholano, actually wrote three works on St. Francis. The Life of St. Francis, abbreviated 1C, was composed between 1228 and 1229. The Remembrance of the Desire of a Soul, abbreviated 2C, was written between 1245 and 1247. And the Treatise on the Miracles, abbreviated 3C, was composed between 1250 and 1252. Another principal biographer of St. Francis is himself a saint, Bonaventure of Bagnoregio. His life of Francis is called The Major Legend, abbreviated LMJ, which he composed between 1260 and 1263. Although there are other Franciscan sources which mention the stigmata, their authors borrow from previous sources, which was then considered perfectly legitimate. In fact, Bonaventure himself borrowed heavily from Thomas of Celano and other sources, but his text has a theological nuance which is not present in other works about the saint. Besides Franciscan hagiography, there are other 13th century sources which mention the stigmata of St. Francis. For lack of a better term, this non-hagiographical literature includes letters, papal documents, sermons, chronicles, and civic records. These witnesses are quite numerous. But for our investigation, we will refer to a letter on the passing of St. Francis attributed to Elias of Assisi. The dating for this is disputed, and I'll explain why presently. 
the annotations of Brother Leo on a parchment to him by St. Francis, again, the dating for this, is, this text is contested, and Mira Chirkarnos, the Bull of Canonization, the official proclamation by Gregory IX that Francis of Assisi was a saint. Other non-hagiographical sources also exist, such as a 1237 list from the Assisi archives of eyewitnesses, mostly lay people, who saw the stigmata, and a 1237 document by Gregory IX entitled Confessor Domini. Now that we've been introduced to the 13th century witnesses to the stigmata of St. Francis, let's prepare to examine their testimonies and explore some of the controversies surrounding them. As part of our preparation, an understanding of the term stigmata is in order, as well as a few historical considerations. I think we all know what stigmata means, but that denotation is actually rather recent. The English word is really the plural form of a Greek word stigma, meaning a mark or puncture, especially one made by a pointed instrument. The same word and its sense were taken into Latin, the language in which our testimonies were written. By the 1590s, the Latin stigma was generally understood as a mark on the skin by burning with a hot iron, like a brand or a tattoo. There it is. Only by the 1630s did the Latin word stigmata commonly refer to marks resembling the wounds on the body of Christ appearing supernaturally on the bodies of the devout. Thus, the understanding of this term as the wounds of the crucified Christ was not common until long after the 13th century. This does not preclude, however, that the term stigmata did denote the wounds of the crucified Christ to some during the 13th century. Latin was also the language of sacred scripture, the Vulgate, at the time of Francis, and the word appears in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. I bear the marks, stigmata, of Jesus on my body. Traditionally, stigmata has been understood here as scars from the flagellations Paul had received and of which he speaks in 2 Corinthians. Additionally, medieval commentators took it to mean baptism's indelible mark on the soul, giving, given today's understanding that this term refers almost exclusively to the wounds of the crucified Christ, calling the marks on Francis's body stigmata may be more of a theological judgment than a historical fact. Let us now turn to a few historical considerations before we hear our witnesses. There is a common maxim among historians. The testimony that is closest to the event and simplest should be considered as most valid. Hagiography is not history, strictly speaking, yet the historical context in which a hagiographical work is composed does significantly affect what is written and why. Thus, historians should not ignore hagiographical sources in their quest for the facts. With the preliminaries taken care of, we can begin our investigation. For the sake of brevity, I will focus on three texts, the letter attributed to Brother Elias, Thomas of Chalano's Life of St. Francis, and Brother Leo's Parchment Annotations, while also alluding to other sources mentioned. Our first witness is a letter on the passing of St. Francis attributed to Elias of Assisi, from which I have already read. The historical context for the composition of this letter can be, deduced, can be deduced from the second paragraph of the text, which is on your handout. Before I begin to speak, I sigh, and rightly so. My groans gush forth like waters in a flood, for I, what I feared has over, overtaken me and has overtaken you and what I dreaded has happened to me and to you. Our consoler has gone away from us, and he who carried us in his arms like lambs has gone on a journey to a far-off country. He who was beloved of God and of man, who taught Jacob the law of life and of discipline, and gave to Israel a covenant of peace, 
has, has been received into the most resplendent dwellings. In other words, Francis is dead. The report appears to have been written by Brother Elias, then Minister General of the Order, with the, within a few hours of Francis's death. The paragraph in which the author describes the stigmata is on the right side of that first page of your handout, the first paragraph in bold print. 18, yeah. Not long before his death, our brother and father appeared crucified, bearing in his body the five wounds which are truly the marks of Christ. His hands and feet had, as it were, the openings of the nails and were pierced front and back, revealing the scars and showing the nails blackness. His side, moreover, seemed opened by a lance and often emitted blood. Because he states that the wound in the side often emitted blood, one could conclude that this is a description of the living body of Francis, which perhaps the author had actually seen prior to the saint's death, but includes here in the letter. He makes no mention of the circumstances under which this may have happened, and he is rather vague as to when, saying only that it was not long before his death. In describing the wounds, the writer states that Francis appeared crucified, a paruit crucifixus, and that his body bore the five wounds which are truly the marks of Christ, quinque plagas que vere sunt stigmata Christi. He goes on to speak of openings of the nails, puncturas clavorum, in the hands and feet, which suggests that these were caused by something piercing the body from the outside in. This could imply that the wounds were produced by self-mutilation, which had been a popular religious practice in imitation of the crucified Christ for several centuries prior to this incident. Or perhaps it meant that the post-mortem appearance of Francis's body was identical to that of Christ. Despite the author's straightforward description, there are implications also from what he does not say. So let us examine several other aspects of this report which have a bearing on our investigation. In number five, the paragraph before the description of the marks, the author announces to the friars news of a miracle, miraculi novitatem, and then he goes on to describe the marks. In the absence of proof that divine intervention was responsible for the wounds, which the author does not state, referring to this phenomenon as a miracle could have been tantamount to blasphemy against Christ for many of the letter's hearers, as indeed it was. It is worth mentioning here that Pope Gregory IX also calls Francis's stigmata a miracle, but not until 1237, when he reprimands certain individuals for not accepting the authenticity of the stigmata. Curiously, Gregory made no specific mention of the stigmata in Mira Circanos, the 1228 bull in which he proclaimed Francis a saint. The only possible allusion to the stigmata, of which Gregory was certainly aware, was the biblically evocative phrase, he offered himself as a holocaust to the Lord, to the Lord, his own flesh. Which could easily have meant that the condition of his body was the result of classically ascetic practices. I will let this ambiguity rest for a while and come back to Gregory's apparent vacillation later. Returning to the letter. In number six, the author then speaks of the condition of Francis's body in death, supposedly seeing it just prior to the writing of the letter. Judging from the adjectives used to describe the unexpectedly radiant corpse of Francis, it seems that the real miracle was the appearance of the deceased man's uncorrupted body, similar to the glorified body of Jesus after the resurrection. Strikingly, there is no mention of the stigmata, in which, in the previous paragraph, which in the previous paragraph seemed equally miraculous. 
This and other inconsistencies in the text create serious doubts as to the authenticity of this letter, which of course impacts the veracity of its testimony. For example, we know from an early Franciscan chronicle that Elias did write a letter to all the friars to announce Francis's death. Multiple copies would then have been made and sent to all the conventos of the friars. So one would expect that at least a few copies of this historic letter would have survived. Yet, this letter was discovered quite late in 1620 in a friary in Belgium by, by William Spalberg, who called it the original letter Brother Elias sent on the death of St. Francis. Curiously, although he published the letter's contents, Spalberg produced no manuscript copy. Another curiosity, neither before nor since Spalberg's discovery has a manuscript copy of this letter ever been found. Thus, the absence of either the original letter or any of its copies places the authenticity of this witness on shaky ground. A second problem concerning the authenticity of this letter is dating, which ostensibly is 1226, the year Francis died. Internal evidence suggests that even if the letter could be dated with certainty, the author was likely not Elias, Brother Elias, for two reasons. The first is that although Elias was model, modestly educated, he did not have schooling in the classics of antiquity or of sacred scripture, and he was never ordained. However, the latter uses biblical imagery similar to both Gregory IX's bull of canonization for Francis and Thomas of Celano's life of St. Francis. This would suggest that either the Pope and the new saint's official biographer borrowed this imagery from Elias or and this is more likely, the borrower of the biblical imagery was the author of the letter. The second reason which casts doubt on a 1226 date of composition is that the letter mentions masses to be offered and prayers to be said by the friars for the deceased. This would appear to be standard procedure at the time of Francis's death, but such prescriptions were not legislated until the 1260 Constitutions of Narbonne, and so the earliest possible dating for the letter is 1260. Brother Elias died in 1253. With so many doubts about its authenticity, it is no wonder that scholars take the testimony of the letter attributed to Brother Elias with a grain of salt. The second witness is Brother Thomas of Celano's Life of St. Francis with its testimony to the stigmata in Numbers 94 and 95. Before becoming a friar, Thomas had been well educated in the liberal arts and probably also in theology, as his florid writing style attests. He was the first to write a biography of the Poverello in the hagiographical style, The Life of St. Francis, which was commissioned by Pope Gregory IX on the occasion of Francis's canonization. The purpose of this work was to introduce the new saint to the Christian world, demonstrating Francis's likeness to Christ in the tradition of the saints of old. As the order rapidly grew and changed, Thomas wrote two other hagiographical works which we have already mentioned. The life of St. Francis was composed two years later after Francis' death amid the canonization fervor. Throughout the text, Thomas dramatically demonstrates Francis' likeness to Christ in stories about his virtue, his prophecy, and especially his devotion to Christ's passion, of which the account of the stigmatization is the climax. In number 94, the section leading up to the description of the stigmata, three of our questions are addressed. Thomas pinpoints the location of the event on Mount Laverna, a hermitage in Tuscany, several days walking distance north of Assisi. More precisely than Elias, 
Thomas reports that this happened two years before the saint's death, so 1224. How the marks appeared on Francis's body is not really explained, but the reader is led to conclude that God had a hand in it. He saw in the vision of God a man, having six wings like a seraph standing over him, arms extended and feet joined affixed to a cross. Two of his wings were raised up, two were stretched out over his head as if for flight, and two covered his body. Thomas notes that while Francis was filled with both joy and sorrow at the sight of the seraph, he could not comprehend the meaning of the vision. It was then, after the vision of the seraph, that the marks appeared, but Thomas does not state that the seraph caused the marks to appear. Still, further on in the life, Thomas does imply divine intervention when he refers to the sacred marks of Jesus Christ. He refers to the sacred marks of Jesus Christ, which Francis bore in his own body. Sacro stigmata Jesu Christi, quae sanctus Franciscus portabat in corpore suo. So he's implying that the sacred that the marks on Francis's body were made by God, but he doesn't say that. In another place, he says, if he was so honored with a unique gift on earth, he must be exalted with unspeakable glory in heaven. This unique gift, a sign of special love, to decorate the soldier with the same arms of glory that in their great dignity belong to the king alone. So in, in saying uh, the decoration, decorating the soldier, he's implying that God did the decorating. Let us now turn to Thomas's description of the stigmata in number 95 on the right side of your handout, the second full paragraph. His hands and feet seem to be pierced through the middle by nails, with the heads of the nails appearing on the inner part of his hands and on the upper part of his feet, and their points protruding on opposite sides. Those marks on the inside of his hands were round, but rather oblong on the outside. And small pieces of flesh were visible like the points of nails, bent over and flattened, extended beyond, extending beyond the flesh around them. On his feet, the marks of nails were stamped in the same way and raised above the surrounding flesh. His right side was marked with an oblong scar as if pierced by a lance, and this often dripped blood so that his tunic and undergarments were frequently stained with his holy blood. The words used to describe the stigmata in the extremities, both here and elsewhere in the life, is more are more specific than in the Elias letter, seemingly the testimony of an eyewitness. Signs of the nails, signa clavorum, and Small pieces of flesh were visible like the points of nails. Caruncula quedum apparebat quasi sumitas clavorum. Instead of openings or holes made by nails, as stated in the Elias letter, Thomas describes in detail what appear to be heads and points of nails protruding above the flesh. The implications of this description are startling. For Thomas's portrait infers that the nails suggested by the bits of flesh actually belonged to Francis's body and came from his very person. Indeed, that the stigmata were produced from the inside out. More than one author hints that perhaps the nails of flesh in the uh, Francis of Assisi early documents translation that you have on your handout they, they don't say nails of flesh. They say flesh like the points of nails. And that this referred to the bloody scabs of leprosy, which Francis could have contracted uh, from, the, from the lepers that he cared for so often. 
The confusion caused by this phrasing in English is a perfect example of a problem evident in using translations. The authors I consulted seem to agree that carunquela quedum aparebat quasi sumitas clavorum meant nails of flesh, whereas the translators of the early documents say no such thing. Could it be that medievalists do translations that lend the greatest credence to their hypotheses? But I digress. Language in the second paragraph of number 95 suggests that the stigmata render Francis as virtually another Christ. The sacred wound in his side, sacrum lateris vulnus, implies a complete identification with Christ. Why else would the wound be called sacred? Likewise, the identifying Francis as the crucified servant of the crucified Lord, crucifixus servus domini crucifixi, indicates the saint is a mirror image of the God-man. Similarly, in describing Francis's body at the time of death, further on in number 112, Thomas implies that Francis's wounds are a copy of Christ's. He says, it seemed he had just been taken down from the cross, his hands and feet pierced by nails, and his right side wounded by a lance. Coupling Chalano's description of the vision of the mysterious crucified seraph and his numerous comments about Francis's holiness with these objective observations about the stigmata, the reader can only conclude, as Thomas doubtless intends, that the source of the stigmata is God himself. We can summarize Thomas of Chilano's testimony by saying that he has shed more light on our questions than did the Elias letter, telling not only when and where the stigmatization occurred, but giving only a clue as to how. Moreover, his description of the stigmata is much more detailed and more nuanced than that of the Elias letter. It would be safe to say that, based on Thomas's evidence, the stigmata are simply God the Father's recognition of the image of his son in the poor man of Assisi. Now we turn our attention to the third witness, Brother Leo of Assisi, and his annotations on a piece of parchment given him by St. Francis at the time when the saint received the stigmata in 1224. Leo's testimony is significant as he was one of Francis's earliest and closest companions, acting also as his confessor and scribe. A 14th century source identifies Leo as Francis's unnamed companion, who is referred to in several accounts of the stigmatization in other Franciscan sources. With all this information so well documented, we can be certain that Leo has something important to say about Francis's stigmata. But first, let's look at the parchment itself. The parchment, a piece of vellum, really, is quite small, measuring five and a half by four inches, with handwriting on both sides in Latin. On the front, Francis wrote the praises of God, and on the back, he penned a, letter, a blessing for Brother Leo with a cryptic drawing underneath a large red towel, the Greek letter shaped like a cross, which, is Francis, which was Francis' signature. And I'm gonna point that out here. There's the towel. These are Francis' letters. Okay, here's that cryptic drawing right there. And uh, another whole lecture could be given uh, all just on the parchment, but I, we won't go there. So those are the letters. The large letters are, are Francis's letters. The small red letters are Leo's. They're Leo's letters, a commentary on the blessing explaining the circumstances under which it was written and given to him. The account of this episode is found in Thomas of Chilano's Second Life of St. Francis. While the saint was secluded in a cell on Mount Laverna, one of his companions was yearning with great desire to have something encouraging from the words of our Lord. Commented, briefly on, commented on briefly by St. Francis 
and written with his own hand. This companion believed that by, means, by this means he would be set free from, or at least could bear more easily, a serious temptation which oppressed him. Yet he feared to express it to the Most Holy Father. But what man did not tell him the Spirit revealed. Francis wrote down with his own hand the praises of God and the words he wanted, and at the, at the end a blessing for that brother, saying, Take this paper for yourself and keep it carefully to your dying day. The whole temptation disappeared immediately. As instructed, Leo kept this parchment on his person until his death in 1278, which explains the evident condition of the peace. And by evident condition, I'm talking about the, the it looks like it's been, um, you know, it, it's kind of ratty on the edges, all right? And you can also see where this, the fold marks in the parchment, because he folded it up and he probably kept it in a pocket on his person for, from 1228 until he died in 1278. So that's quite a long time. Leo's annota annotations are, uh, are found on page three of your handout on the right side. He says, two years before his death, the Blessed Francis spent 40 days on Mount Laverna from the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary until the September Feast of St. Michael in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the Mother of God, and the Blessed Michael the Archangel. And the Lord's hand was upon him. After the vision and the message of the seraph and the impression of Christ's stigmata on his body, he composed these praises written on the other side of this page, and wrote them in his own hand, thanking God for the kindness bestowed on him. So what I read was right there. All those little red letters there and a couple red letters here is, is all of this that was, that was written on the parchment. So you can imagine how tiny the writing had to be. In his description, Leo answers two of our questions and gives a hint about the third one. When two year, when is the two years before Francis' death. In this, he concurs with Thomas of Celano, but is even more precise. During 40 days, that is, a Lent, from the Feast of, of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, August 15th, until the September Feast of St. Michael, September 29th. So between August 15th and September 29th of 1224. In his major life of St. Francis, Bonaventure agrees, but with more precision, saying that the day was a certain morning about the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, September 14th. One scholar suggests, however, that given the spiritual significance of the event of the stigmatization, such a correspondence between the stigmata, receiving the stigmata and the Feast of the Holy Cross may simply have been a hagiographical device. Having established when the event took place, Leo tells us the location, Mount Laverna. Like Thomas of Celano, Leo indicates that Christ's stigmata were impressed on Francis's body, and he links the act of impression with the vision and message of the seraph. The lack of details about the vision of the seraph could imply that all this was common knowledge. But he does not say that the seraph produced the marks, nor does he even imply that this was the case. However, Leo does add that Francis thanked God for the kindness bestowed on him. Was this kindness Christ's stigmata, the vision and message of the seraph, or both? Leo offers no clarity on this, but Francis's thanks to God certainly implies that God is the origin of the event. As with the Elias letter, there is a question about the dating of Leo's annotations, the implications of which will be clear presently. Although Francis's writing on the parchment is surely from 1224, Leo's annotations are thought to be much later perhaps at a time when the reputation of the friar's minor was at stake 
during the so-called mendicant controversy of uh, the 1250s and 1260s. In this, the church had entrusted important positions to the friars, which called their public witness of poverty and humility into question, and therefore the, the uh, credibility of the order. Or perhaps Leo penned his remarks as a reaction to the numerous individuals and groups, friars among them, who since the 1230s had doubted the authenticity of his friend's stigmata. If Leo's annotations were added to the parchment long after 1224, it is likely that he would certainly have known both the Elias letter and Thomas of Celano's Life of St. Francis, as well as the many other hagiographical legende, Lives of Francis, including Bonaventures, and their descriptions, accounts of, or references to the stigmata. Given the tenuous status of the Friars Minor in the, in the mid-13th century, Leo would have wanted to bolster the order's reputation by authenticating the stigmata as a sign of Francis's complete transformation into Christ. Influenced by these factors, as some authors suggest, it's not unlikely that Leo could have penned his annotations to agree with Thomas's account so as to help the cause. If this is true, then where would Thomas have gotten his information about the vision of the seraph if not from Leo, who was at least nearby during the vision? On the other hand, if the annotations were made soon after Francis gave Leo the parchment, could they have been the source for Thomas's account of the vision and the reference to the marks or wounds as the stigmata of Christ? Regardless of the dating of the parchment, Brother Leo likely knew more than he could or would say in writing, especially in such a tiny space. What he really knew about the stigmata may rest with his remains in, the, in Assisi. At this point, I wish to offer another perspective on the stigmata of St. Francis. By now, you may regret having uh, come to this lecture. We began with simple questions about how the stigmata appeared on Francis's body, when the event occurred, and where. And we queried as to who the witnesses might have been. Then, highlighting th three among several 13th century Franciscan sources as witnesses, we heard their testimonies, discussing their implications, as well as some controversies surrounding them. After all that, however, I think you would agree that more questions have been raised than were answered. This brings me to something I posed at the outset. Does our probe into the Franciscan sources for the stigmata's authenticity cause us to lose sight of something more profound regarding the saint himself? A brief examination of the process of canonization and Francis's bull of canonization can lead us in a different and I think a more satisfactory direction. It was during the lifetime of Francis that the process of canonization was undergoing an extreme makeover. Until the late 12th century, about the only thing needed for an official declaration of sainthood was public acclamation at the local level. That is, a lot of people saying he's a saint. A public acclamation at the lower level testifying to the apparent holiness of a deceased Christian. This local, ac local canonization was thus proclaimed in the diocese of the deceased and eventually accepted by the universal, that is the European church. However, this method often produced saints who upon later investigation either never existed or whose holiness was questionable at best and fraudulent at worst. What kind of attitude contributed to this? At the local level, word of sensational miracles, usually healings, made the rounds more rapidly than even substantial reports of prayerfulness, virtue, or charitable works even though these latter were truer indications of one's likeness to Christ. However, 
there was often no ecclesiastical quality assurance of testimonies to either the miracles or virtue. Moreover, for locals who were usually illiterate and only moderately knowledgeable of their faith, miracles were the principal focus and virtue was secondary. After all, miracles were observable. At the beginning of the 13th century, the process of canonization was becoming standardized and centralized by the Roman Curia so as to substantiate all sainthood assertions. This involved interviews, when possible, with persons who knew the deceased and investigation into the validity of miracles claimed to have been worked through the intercession of the purported saint. However, the focus of the church investigators was primarily on the person's holiness. That is, heroic virtue as likeness to Christ had to be shown beyond the shadow of a doubt. Only secondarily were miracles considered. So it is that in Mira Circanos, the bull of canonization for Francis, Pope Gregory IX, formerly Ugolino, cardinal protector of the Order of Friars Minor, friend and advisor to Francis, expounds on Francis's virtuous life with overflowing praise and numerous biblical allusions, but makes only an ambiguous reference to the stigmata about halfway through the proclamation. And you do not have this on your handout. But I, I have uh, excerpted uh, parts of, of what I'm going to say here. As he approached the land of vision, Gregory says, on one of the mountains that had been shown him, namely the height of faith, he offered as a holocaust to the Lord his own flesh. When he had, this, when he had thus crucified his flesh with its passions and desires, he was able to say with the apostle, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Truly, he no longer lived for himself, but rather for Christ. Some interpret this ambigu ambiguity to mean that Gregory knew about the stigmata, but perhaps chose not to believe in them. With such an unclear reference, he would have been able to satisfy the likes of Brother Elias and Thomas of Chilano, and even Leo, while officially sidestepping the issue. Others say that this vague reference was not to the stigmata, but to Francis's practice of self-mutilation or punishment, self-punishment, of which there is ample testimony in the Franciscan sources. In other words, um, you can read many stories about how Francis used to beat his body. He uh, uh, underwent severe fasting and all kinds of other um, uh, ascetical practices in imitation of Christ. Toward the end of the bull of canonization, Gregory sums up his enumerations of Francis's virtues. Clearly, a life like his, so holy, so heroic, and so outstanding, was sufficient to win for him a place in the church triumphant, meaning heaven. The only mention of miracles in the entire document, Bull of Canonization, is one sentence just before the proclamation of Francis's inscription into the Catalog of Saints. Rather, God has shown that he wishes the lamp of Francis's Christ-like life to be placed on a lampstand to give the consolation of light to those in the house by declaring through numerous and outstanding miracles that Francis's life was pleasing to God and that his memory should be venerated by the church militant. That's the church Christians on earth, you and me. For Gregory, as for the church, Francis's virtuous Christ-like life is what makes him not only venerable, a saint, but worthy of imitation. It's not the miracles, and it's certainly not the stigmata. If the, peop, if the pope who knew and canonized Francis placed more emphasis on the ways in which the Pavarello was like Christ, should that not be our focus as well? One scholar has pointed out that the life project of the converted merchant of Assisi was 
to follow the teaching and footprints of our Lord Jesus Christ, as stated in the earlier rule for the Friars Minor. For Francis, this teaching and footprints of Christ entailed assuming for himself and his followers the conditions of the poor of his time, in this way reproducing the path chosen by Christ in his incarnation and which he re repeats daily in the Eucharist. It required of Francis a serene acceptance of the condition of renunciation and marginalization and suffering. This path leads to the cross and culminates in the resurrection. Thus, for Francis, as for the church which canonized him, the one thing that mattered, the goal and objective of his life, was to be transformed into Christ. I live, no longer I, but Christ lives in me. As reported in the Franciscan sources, Francis considers the stigmata a secret and intimate gift of God about which he did not want to share either the manner in which they were imparted or any familiarity with the divine giver. If we who admire Francis do not maintain a sense of holy awe and wonder at, indeed, a sense of deep respect for what God communicated to Francis in the stigmata, we run the risk that any investigation will become something like gaping at a sideshow freak. Perhaps Thomas of Celano said it best in his treatise on the miracles. Whatever human speech can say about this will be less than the praise it deserves. No explanation should be demanded because it was a wonder. No example should be sought because it was unique. When I first thought about doing this lecture, I had planned that it would, co con that it would coincide with the Feast of the Stigmatization of Francis on September 17th. Although so this would have been appropriate, it wasn't possible. It now seems providential that this investigation into the stigmata of St. Francis is actually taking place during the Lenten season. This is the time during which we walk with Christ on his way to the cross. Gradually shedding sinful habits and growing in virtues like patience, charity, and generosity, so as to join with Jesus in our own mini resurrection at Easter. Lent is a journey of transformation, a telescoping of our entire lives into six weeks of striving to conform ourselves more closely to Christ. Our Lent then mirrors the conversion journey of Francis, or at least it could. Assuming that Francis really did receive the marks of the crucified Christ as a living enfleshment of the passion, it would only have been because he had already been crucified with Christ in his mind and heart. With this understanding, it's not a stretch to say that Francis of Assisi is a model for us in our Lenten and our life project as Christians, transformation into Christ. I leave you with these lines from Laudus 61 by the late 13th century Franciscan poet Jacopone de Todi. The burning love of Christ, whose depths are lost to sight, enfolded Francis, softened his heart like wax, and there pressed its seal, leaving the marks of the one to whom he was united. I have no words for this dark mystery. How can I understand or explain the superabundance of riches, the disproportionate love of a heart on fire. Thank you. Thank you, Sister. That was an excellent lecture. Um, I have a historic question. Uh, you mentioned that Brother Leo was the con uh, confessor for mm -hmm. uh, Brother Francis. Francis. Was right. that a common thing then, that it wasn't a priest to listen to confession? Brother Leo was a priest. He was a priest. The, the friars all referred to each other as brothers, whether they were ordained or not. And, Thank you. And the vast majority of them were ordained, uh, or excuse me, were lay, laymen when they joined the order. Uh, Leo was a priest when he joined the order. So um, he was able to hear Francis' confession, say mass for him, and those kinds of things. You said our Lent mirrors, but then I couldn't 
catch the rest of that quote. You probably have to look at your notes for that. What was it? Our Lent mirrors. Our Lent mirrors the conversion journey of Francis. Thank you. Um, or it could, should, depending on how you look at it. The process of naming a, a holy person a saint changed from the early years that mm -hmm. you mentioned in your, in your tape. Um, when did it change? And, and why did it change? I'm not familiar with how the process of canonization developed after the Middle Ages. Um, so I, I really don't know. But I can tell you, if you're referring to why did the naming of these people, why the different stages, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's why? one of the questions. Okay. Um, my guess is that the, that the church wanted to be even more precise on, um, on making sure that there were no fraudulent claims to sanctity. Okay? Um, and so that's why it takes so long. Uh, even in the, the Middle Ages, you know, once this standardization process of canonization had kicked in, um, it still took a long time, and there were very few people who were fast-tracked uh, into sainthood. Um, Francis was one, Claire was, was another one in 12, she died in 1253, she was canonized in 1220, uh, 1255. Um, a, a number of Franciscan saints were kind of like on the fast track. But other people, it took a long time because you had to investigate, you had to interview people, you had to, to talk to the people who claimed miracles were worked at the intervention of the saint, and so on. So um, the, the more people claim something, the more you have to investigate uh, about whether or not their claims are true. And that's why even today it takes a long time. So Francis was never ordained a priest, correct? Correct. Correct. And that was by his own choice? That was by his own choice. He did not feel that, that he was worthy to become a priest, as many men don't. Um, there are some sources that say he was a deacon. Uh, the, the story of the, um, of the nativity, of the living nativity in 1223, uh, Thomas of Chilano describes him as a deacon. And he, he proclaims the gospel, and he gives the sermon. Okay, uh, But uh, curiously, uh, there are no records of his ordination anywhere. You talked about how the miracles weren't as important as the virtue, mm -hmm. but now are, do they have to have the miracles proven to become saints? Miracles are still required, if you will, for, for canonization, uh, but only after the person's, uh, her when I say heroic virtue, that means more virtue than you and I are capable of, probably. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, way above the average bear as far as a, a Christian life is concerned, and and uh, like over the top virtue, and and so um, when that has been established, then the miracles are looked at as a kind of a um, kind of a, a, a rubber stamp of God, if you will. Okay, that that the virtue is authentic. All right. And, and I'm using words that make it sound very mechanical, but it's not, all right? There, there's a lot of prayer and thought as well as investigation, literal investigation, that goes into the process of canonization for anyone. And, and so, um, you know, it's, how, how, do you, how do you verify that somebody is in heaven when none of us are there? You know, th there's no witness in heaven that can report back down to us and say, yeah, he's really here. See, so um, it, it becomes a, a, a very um, um, iffy kind of thing. Uh, Lance Ritchie, Theology Department. Wonderful presentation, sister. There are so many questions about sainthood. I, it seems in the back of my mind, Kenneth Woodward, who was the Newsweek religion reporter, about 10 or 15 years ago, wrote a book called, I think, Making Saints. Uh -huh where he examined the history and the process. So if someone's interested in those mm -hmm. questions, his name is Kenneth Woodward, and I think the book is Making Saints. He's a Catholic, and it was very well received, and it would probably answer a lot of those questions for me as well about Thank how you. the process developed over yeah. time. Yeah, sounds like a book I need. <laughs> no, a book that I need. Yeah. <laughs> Sister, is his body preserved? Francis's body, yes. meaning is it incorrupt? 
Yes. Is that what you mean by the question? Well, I attended uh, the church in Assisi, St. Francis of Assisi The Basilica church. of St. Francis. And mm -hmm. we went to mass. In down, the crypt. Right. Mm -hmm. I believe the altar is on top of his nine, no? No, the altar is in front of a stone column and inside the stone column, you've, you've got like an opening in the column kind of toward the middle and you can mm -hmm. see a, 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 stone, a stone box, it looks like, mm -hmm. okay, a limestone box. And on that, it has a little label and it says S period Francesco, Francisco's or something like that. That is his sarcophagus. His body is in there in the stone column, okay? okay. And, and is it incorrupt? No. The, the only thing they, they opened, the last time they opened it, somebody can correct me here, I think was 1968 or something like that, and all they found was bones. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It would appear that St. Francis then got his wish. He wanted the stigmata, right? Well, this is the thing. If you read in, in Thomas of Chilano's life, and I believe Bonaventure always, also talks about this, when Francis was making the Lent on Laverna, he, he was praying, he was, he was exceedingly um, worked up about all kinds of things that were going on in the order that were not the way he thought God wanted it to be and, and not the way he was trying to live. And, and so he's, he's doubting his own vocation and all of this. And so he, he prays to God to be able to suffer the same kinds of physical sufferings in his body that Jesus suffered, and to experience in his heart and in his mind the same kind of desolation that Christ experienced on the cross. He prays for this. Was he praying for the stigmata? Probably not. He probably had no clue as to how or if God would answer that prayer. But Thomas of Chilano leads us to believe that the stigmata was the answer to that prayer, okay? Now, again, you know, nobody saw this happen, uh, and, and only, his, um, only his very closest companions, there were four companions, uh, Leo, Maceo, Rufino, and Angelo, brothers, who were, who were with him most of the time during his last few years because he was also extremely sick. He had fasted way too much, he, his body was wasted, he had malaria probably, possibly this leprosy going on. Uh, he had trachoma in his eyes and was blind and, and he was a mess. And, and so they're, they're taking care of him and helping him you know, with his clothing and wash his body and those kinds of things. They had to have seen something. They had to have known something. But there's very little, and, and he, he he swore them to secrecy, basically. So we don't know if the, if the stigmata, you know, first of all, we don't know if it really was the marks of Christ imprinted on his body, as I was trying to say in the lecture. You know, it could have been a number of other things because stigmata, meaning wounds of Christ, didn't really mean that in the 13th century. It meant marks, marks on the body, marks. And, and if they were positioned in such a way as to suggest the crucified Christ, then people would have thought that. Um, I just wondered from, from the, way he, the way that reference was that mm -hmm. not the I in me, but the Christ in me. You know, right. It keeps coming back to that. Right. You keep saying I that. live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. Right, that's right. So mm -hmm. got that idea. Uh, in reference to other people that have had the stigmata, is it, it's been proven? Like, wasn't there a priest somewhere in Padre Spain? Pio, Padre Pio. Padre Pio in yeah. Italy. He was um, he lived in the 20, 20th century. He was born in the first part of the 20th century. Died in 1968. He was a stigmatic, and he had the stigmata already um, from about 12, uh, 1924, okay, or 28. I can't remember the exact date, but anyway. Uh, supposedly he bore those stigmata then for all those rest of his years, which was probably about 40 years. Francis bore the stigmata supposedly for two years until his death, okay? And, you know, when, when they examined his hands, 
you know, they said, this is not cosmetic. These are real wounds, you know, and they really bled, which is why he had to have bandages on him and wear gloves, okay? And they, they, they were painful, you know? So is that what Francis experienced? We don't know. You know, nobody was there with a mini cam, you know, <laughs> uh, taking pictures. You know, nobody had their digital camera or anything like that. So we don't, and, and all of the artwork that I showed you, um, a lot of it was from the, the late 13th and early 14th century. There could be another whole lecture just on the, the visualizations in, uh, in the 13th and 14th century of Francis's stigmata. Um, because, you know, they're just going by what the witnesses that we talked about said. So um, if you came here, <laughs> you know, expecting to find out, you know, Francis, how this really happened and all that, I'm, I'm probably disappointed you. But I think you can see, though, the difficulty that we have, even as faithful Catholics and Christians, you know, looking at these, these texts from the 13th century and trying to get some historical facts out of them. We really can't. We really can't. And so, you know, it, it's, I would say, you know, is it okay to believe that Francis had the wounds of Christ? Yeah, sure. You know, um, is it okay to believe that he didn't? It's up to you. Um, but it becomes a, a matter of faith. And, and yet, that's not the important point. The important point is, Francis was like Christ before he had the stigmata. And if I'm going to, if I, especially if I'm a Franciscan, and there are some Franciscan, secular Franciscans here in the, in the crowd and some of the sisters and so on, if I'm going to be like Francis, I have to imitate his life, not his stigmata. Okay, that's, that's the point. Okay, you said when he was on Mount Laverna yes. that he was already... Um agonizing over some of the problems within mm -hmm. the Franciscans. Had they already begun to live more excessively? Or oh, what was yeah. that, so that occurred still during his life? Yes, yes. Okay. And so what you, when you're talking about live more excessively, what, what that meant was uh, around 1215, the church needed real good preachers. They needed uh, priests, and, and they needed the Franciscans and the Dominicans, really, to be educated uh, so that they could preach against the heretics. Okay, that were rampant at that time. And so Francis says to the brothers, you know, I'm not called to that. And a few other of the brothers were with Francis. I'm not called to that. I'm called to live a simple life, you know, poor and, and all of this. If you guys want to go and get educated, go ahead, because the church needs us. And go ahead and do that. So obviously, if they're going to be educated in the universities, they're going to need books. They're going to need houses for the books. There's, they're going to need. Um, they're going to take care of parishes. They're going to. They're not going to be on the road all the time. They're going to be um, less mobile and still yet living in urban areas, taking care of people's spiritual needs and so on. Okay, but but Francis did not feel called to this. He his original call he felt was to simplicity, to poverty, to um, to being out with the people in any way that he possibly could, on the road all the time, like Jesus, okay? And so when he saw the order going in a different direction, he was like, you know, okay, guys, if that's what you want to do, and if you, and, we, and the church needs that, go ahead, but that's not me. So this, this was the struggle that he had, and yes, it was during his lifetime. Is there any reason or um, in the research about um, the reasons why uh, St. Francis may have uh, kept, wanted to keep this secret? Mm, yes. It's, it, you don't have to look far. Uh, the reason he wanted to keep the wounds a secret is because he felt that if he, um, if, if people, if a lot of people knew about them, they would make more to do about the wounds than they would about being good Christians, okay? He, he, it was his humility that kept him from, from making them known, okay? And also because, as I said at the end, he, he felt that they were a gift from God and something intimate that God shared with him. And so it, it's kind of like, for those of you who are married, how do you tell people about, or do you tell people about 
when you have sex with your wife or your husband. You don't. It's an intimate experience. It's between you and the other person, you know? And so you just don't share those things with other people, you know? And that's the way it was for Francis. So what is the connection between St. Francis and the animals, the oh. love of animals? <laughs> that's another whole lecture. <laughs> Uh, that's a, no, that's a perfectly legitimate question. Um, the, the connection is that, that Francis was so much like Christ he, that he had attained or reattained the original innocence of Adam and Eve before the fall. That's what Christ was. He, he was Adam and Eve before the fall, okay? So Francis is so much like Christ that the animals aren't afraid of him. You know, there's, no, there's nothing to keep, there's, there's, it's, it's a right relationship between this man and the animals. And there are numerous stories, um, a lot of them are really cute, to, to talk about how Francis had, you know, either converse with the animals or that they, that they just were drawn to him. It was because of his, of his innocence, of his goodness. But of course, that's the work of a lifetime. You know, to get to something like that, to, to where, you know, um, and, and there are some people, you know, you probably know people yourself who seem to have a way with animals, and it's probably because they're very authentic. They, they don't put on about anything. They're just really good people. And so Francis, uh, I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah. All your questions about Francis that you always wanted to ask and never <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. God bless you.